Welcome to Paris and welcome to EuroPCR 2019. My name's Bernard Prendergast. I'm an interventional cardiologist from St. Thomas's Hospital in London. And I'm joined this morning by my friends Hélène Alchaninoff from Rouen in France and Endrik Trida from Bonn in Germany. And our topic this morning is to discuss the impact of the latest evidence in the field of TAVI on everyday clinical practice. Hélène, 2019 has been a landmark year for valve disease with trials of major impact uh, published and presented earlier in the year. Can you give us a little summary of, of the latest evidence? Yes. So at the last ACC in uh, Orlando, we presented uh, the two uh, large randomized trials in low-risk uh, patients, the one with the Sapiens 3, the Partner 3 trial, and the uh, Evolute Low Risk with the Evolute uh, Valve. And uh, the results were very impressive, and there was even a standing ovation. It was uh, the evaluation of TAVI versus surgery in low-risk patients greater than 65, excluding bicuspid valves, and this uh, trial showed either equal result to surgery or even superior to surgery with the S3 using transfemoral approach. So very impressive. So a truly pivotal moment in the evolution of transcatheter valve technologies. And we, Enric, we now have evidence in inoperable patients, high risk, intermediate risk, low risk. Is now the time to stop talking about risk categories and just talk about clinical parameters instead? Yeah, I feel a certain kind of relief that we can now somehow get rid of the risk score calculation because it was never a good idea. They also have never been developed for Chavi in mind. So um, now the decision goes back to the heart team. It's more about looking into the patients, into their diseases, and then decide within the heart team what's the best treatment for the patient disregarding the risk scores. So really the risk scores are a remnant of research methodology rather than something we now need to use in everyday heart exactly. team discussions. So how does this translate, Helen, into the heart team uh, functionality in Rouen? How, how do you take these results on board? Uh, we are very impressed and of course pleased with these results, but it's too early because we need to validate this and it has to be in the guidelines, so it will probably come in the near future, I hope. But today uh, we are still at uh, the treating the intermediate risk patients and mainly the patients who are over 80 years of age, sometimes closer to 75. And this is in a hard team discussion for uh, each patient and of course according to various parameters like uh, uh, the access, uh, the feasibility, etc. So we are not yet at the stage where we'll discuss TAVI in uh, low-risk patients less than uh, 75, 80, 80. Okay. not yet. So the 2017 guidelines, of course, suggested 75 years yes. as a working threshold. Some might say that with low risk, we can go into even younger group uh, groups of patients. But Andrik, mm. Clearly, surgery is going to retain a role for some of these patients, and there will be technical factors. There will be the question of durability. Yeah. What's your interpretation of these important parameters? So definitely, I don't think age is the major parameter here. We should rather look into the patient's diseases and also the anatomies of the aortic valves. I see certain bicuspid valves still being very good surgery candidates, as well as, of course, endocarditis and uh, root pathologies that may come alongside but also maybe the need for future PCI in patients that also have coronary artery disease. So these are all subsets of patients who will be very good candidates for surgery in the future. And again, it goes back to the heart team to decide which one goes which direction. And we shouldn't forget, of course, that specifically bicuspid aortic valve is frequently associated with aortic root pathology. Absolutely. And we're treating more than just the valve. We need to be looking at the composite anatomy of the root where surgeons will continue to play a very important role. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. What's your particular perspective on the patient, let's say, who has aortic stenosis and relatively complex coronary disease? Is there a role for PCI with TAVI? Or does that remain a surgical combination, do you think? Well, there definitely is a role because many of those patients come with higher risk, not so much depending on the score evaluation, but just, you know, looking at their comorbidities. So some of them will be perfect candidates for PCI plus TAVI, but we have to be careful. We also have to discuss about the directions of things, so rather do PCI first before doing TAVI. And we have to make sure that we pick the right devices, the devices that specifically leave access to the coronary arteries. So another key feature in younger patients, of course, Helene, will be the question of durability. And you did some of the first TAVI procedures in the world, along with Professor uh, Cribier, so you, you are no stranger to the question of durability and long-term survival. 
So what's your, what's your interpretation of the latest information regarding the durability of TAVI mm -hmm. and what research endeavours are ongoing to address this question? So um, that's true that um, we have today data at seven, eight years in uh, registries and treating patients uh, from the early age, so either compassionate or high risk. And at seven, eight years, there is no alarm since the rate of reintervention, if we use the definition which was used by the surgeon, is less than 1%. So it's, uh, there is no alarm at all. But uh, we don't have this um, evaluation in younger risk in younger patients at 65. So we need, of course, to follow uh, the patients. I know partner three will follow the patient at 10 years. We need also to follow all our patients. And there is a, a large ongoing European registry, which will uh, aim to, to, to follow all the patients with clinical and echographic assessment to, to, to have a longer as possible follow up. But uh, already it will be with all the devices, etc. So each time we have follow up, we don't have the, the more recent devices. Yeah. But of course, it's important. I think it's not very important for patients over 75 because they can benefit from one valve in valve. Mm -hmm. But when you are 65, it's, you cannot imagine to have three valve in valve, like TAVI, valve in valve in TAVI, and the second valve in valve. So the question will be more for younger patients, I think. Absolutely. But I know anecdotally you have 10 year survivors in Rouen yes. whose valves are working yes, very, well, very well, and yes. they're still benefiting from the procedure yes. performed over a decade yes. ago. Yes, yeah. that's true. Mm. So clearly, uh, we are now entering a phase where there will be an explosion potentially of demand for, uh, for TAVI uh, with, with new evidence and, and patients expressing a preference for a, a transcatheter rather than an open surgical procedure. So one of the dilemmas will be how we cope with the demand. And that will mean uh, two things as I see it. One is that the number of TAVI procedures performed in individual centres will need to increase. Maybe we'll need more TAVI centres and maybe we'll need to think about surgeons becoming more engaged in TAVI procedures themselves. So, Helene, how do you uh, in Rouen plan to deal with the increasing demand and how to do more procedures per day, per week? And Enrique, what about training the next generation of surgeons? So, Ellen. Yes. So we are planning to. Um, we have patients are discharged very early, so this is already a good option because they need to stay one day, one a night of, on monitoring. So this was done in intensive care, we, but we can also do it just in a ward with monitoring without being intensive care. So I think we can accommodate. So and, a simplified um, procedure, simplified, a simplified pathway. Yes, pathway. And uh, I think we, will, we are thinking about um, opening new beds for a bed, medical surgical beds, like a unit dedicated to uh, valvular disease to, to accommodate the, the number of patients. Okay, mm. and Enrique, do you agree at the mm. moment at least TAVI should remain only in surgical centers? Um, I would say yes, because this is where I feel the heart team has the most impact and the best decision making. But you are completely right, surgeons have to go into the field and take this as part of their portfolio. And, and I'm telling people this also in surgical community meetings for more than 10 years now. And I can just hope that with the new data that came up, they tend to listen a bit more. But it also means, and this is really something I'd like to ask my cardiology colleagues, they have to open up the hybrid ORs for their surgeons and make them part of the team, not only in the decision-making process, but also during the implantations. And only then we will find a common sense for it and the best decision-making for patients. So an exciting year for uh, TAVI, an exciting year for the field of structural intervention with new evidence, with a new impetus to drive TAVI into new uh, populations of patients, but also importantly, renewed emphasis on the importance of heart team working and the collaboration between interventional cardiologists and cardiac surgeons. Thank you very much for joining us.